Hello and welcome to this latest session where I'm going to be talking about cryptocurrency with some guests who I'll introduce in a moment. But more specifically, we're going to talk about seven metrics that support a bullish outlook for Ethereum. And that's why, indeed, I've got the guys from the MacroHive team on the call, because it was from their very research that I wanted to get some more information about these seven reasons. And very fortunate timing because it's 9th of November and overnight we've seen both Bitcoin and Ethereum hit fresh all-time record highs. The actual crypto market now has hit 3 trillion US dollars for the very first time. So really excited to uh, have this conversation at the most optimal timing where people of course are very interested in all cryptos, but specifically gonna talk about Ethereum. So just by way of introduction, uh, I've got on the call Bilal Hafiz, who's the CEO and editor of Macro Hive, and he was also the former head of global research likes of Deutsche Bank and Nomura, and he's joined, joined by his colleague Dalvir Mandara, who's a quantitative researcher at Macro Hive as well. So without further ado, guys, um, the seven bullish reasons, I'd love, love to um, get a breakdown and hear more about them. Uh, great, thank you. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much, Anthony. And uh, yeah, welcome everyone on, on to listen to this uh, YouTube, uh, this video. Um, uh, you know, we at Macro High, traditionally, we tended to focus on more of what I guess now is called TradFi or traditional finance markets. So, you know, bonds, FX, equities, credit, and so on. But in recent months, we really have uh, gone uh, um, really deeply into the crypto market as well. Uh, you know, one reason is it's obviously grown, uh, you know, exponentially in recent years. Uh, but also from a technology perspective, you know, there's lots of elements of crypto that tells us that it's here to stay in one form or, or another. And from a finance perspective, I think we're at an interesting juncture right now where um, the technology side is still there, but lots of finance people are coming into the crypto space. So there's this in, in, in interesting mix now of finance uh, people kind of thinking about what crypto means. Now, in terms of our work, if you just go to, you know, the, the MacroHive site, you know, we have our normal normal type of content. But if you if you click on here on crypto, we, we publish our pieces on crypto. At the moment, we're focusing primarily on Bitcoin and Ethereum. And I just wanted to show off a bit here, hence going to this page here. But uh, back in a few weeks ago, back in 21st of October, we said that Ethereum is likely to hit $5,000 in the coming weeks. And today on November the 9th, uh, if I just pull up a, pull up a, a Bloomberg screen here of uh, Ethereum, the e ETH is trading up close to $4,800. So we're, we're almost at the $5,000 mark. Uh, so we're 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 basically trading at sort of close uh, close at all time highs and close to our target of five thousand uh, dollars. This is Bitcoin. Bitcoin has also risen recently. It had a bit of consolidation beforehand, and again, just to show off again, we published a piece uh, a few weeks ago saying this is not the big Bitcoin correction, where people were getting worried that this this consolidation here was the beginning of a move down in Bitcoin. We argued no, no that's not the case. Uh, Bitcoin is going to continue to, to rise. Um, now, what, what gives us this level of confidence or conviction around this is that we built a framework to try to understand crypto. And what I find being a relative newcomer to the crypto world is that you tend to find that uh, there's, you know, that the research analysis side of crypto is almost like the, the Wild West, where people have sort of outlandish targets with no real basis. They look at charts, also second analysis, with breakouts and so on, um, which, which has some value, but it's not enough. And so what we try to do at MacroHive is that we try to build some kind of framework on analytics around how to forecast crypto markets. Um, so we use kind of flow, positioning information, but also a lot of on-chain analytics, because one of the big, um, uh, advantages of crypto is that all the data is available to the public in one form or another because everything's on on the blockchain. And in this uh, in this video, we're basically going to go through our framework for Ethereum, which is similar to our framework for Bitcoin as well. So the last piece we published on Ethereum, which kind of runs through the framework we published um, a week or so ago, where we talked about how we think Ethereum is going to outperform Bitcoin, um, and you know we provide some context here. But if I just 
you know, jump straight into the framework itself, we, we essentially look at seven different factors that we think are most important for trying to understand the future direction of Ethereum and, and Bitcoin. Um, I mean, before I go on, the one thing I, I, I just wanted to add is that I'm not really going to go into whether Ethereum has a future or not, or whether Bitcoin has a future or not. That's a, for a separate sort of conversation, separate debate, and we've had those debates before. So this is with the assumption that you know, Ethereum is here to stay, given that you know, how can we forecast uh, Ethereum or, or indeed Bitcoin or other cryptocurrencies. Um, so the first factor we like to look at is institutional demand, and this probably has been perhaps the biggest story over the past year, year and a half since the advent of COVID, where suddenly the mainstream finance community has gone into crypto. Beforehand, it was really uh, the technology guys or just people who had a particular interest in crypto. Now suddenly mainstream institutions are investing in crypto as well. And the clearest manifestation of this is the rise of uh, ETFs, ETF products, exchange traded fund products, which allows the average investor, whether you're a retail investor or whether you're an institutional investor, to get exposure to Ethereum or to Bitcoin through a product that you're allowed to buy. So many institutions are not allowed to hold Ethereum or Bitcoin directly on an exchange, on a crypto exchange. Uh, instead, they, they are allowed to hold an ETF, which has exposure to the underlying, which is Ethereum uh, or to Bitcoin. Um, and in the case of Ethereum, there's a whole range of ETFs that have been launched. Uh, many of, most of them, there's a whole bunch in Canada, a bunch in Europe. I don't think we have one yet in, in the US, but I'm sure one is soon to come. We had the first Bitcoin futures ETF uh, was launched um, a, a few weeks ago, which has helped the, the rally in Bitcoin. But nevertheless, there is ways for global investors to get exposure to Ethereum without having to hold Ethereum directly. So we track these ETF flows. Um, and so this chart here shows you the ETF flows into Ethereum uh, ETFs. And so what you can see is in recent weeks, there's been a surge of flows into Ethereum ETFs. And for us, this is a very bullish signal. So what you were seeing at the, uh, uh, at the end of the summer uh, or around October time, Ethereum prices started to go up. So Ether prices started to go up. But there really wasn't much uh, institutional flow supporting that, that, that price increase. But since, say, the last, say, three, four weeks, suddenly with this uh, rise in uh, Ether prices, you suddenly see institutional flow starting to come in and it's starting to accelerate. So this metric for us is, is quite a bullish signal for Ethereum and Ether prices uh, you know, going forward. So this tells us that institutions are back in crypto and they're buying uh, Ethereum through these ETFs. And you'll see something similar on the Bitcoin side as well. So this is one metric. Is, is there any so, way for, uh, is, sorry about that, is there any question on this for a, a, a regular person, let's say, to access the type of outflow inflow data for this type of, to obtain this sort of metric? Where would they go to do that? That's a good question. I mean, in terms of getting this data, in theory, you could basically go to the ETF providers' sites, and I think they would each individual website would have the flow data that you can get. So you you could kind of do it in a very manual basis. Otherwise, data providers, whether it's Bloomberg, Affinitiv, would have that data as well. I'm sure there's other cheaper, lower cost data providers that may have this data as well. Um, on top of that, Macro Hive, what we're doing is we're publishing these charts. Uh, on a, on a weekly or bi-weekly basis. So you could just come to the site and then you'll just see what the flows are. So that's another way as well. Um, so there are sort of different ways, um, you know, some are more manual, um, you know, so there's kind of a range of different ways you can get access to that data. Okay. Sounds now good. the, so that's the first one, you know, trying to track institutional demand. And for us, the proxy, the best way of tracking institutional demand is ETFs. Uh, the second one is this whole idea of liquidity, um, and this is a bit more for the crypto geeks out there, which is the idea that if people who hold Ethereum, so this is the people who actually hold the Ethereum uh, coins directly, so these are not people who use ETFs, so these are a bit more of the crypto native crowd. Um, one measure of bullishness is how much liquidity do the people who hold Ethereum want? Um, now, so if you're very bullish, if I'm a holder of Ethereum and I'm very bullish on Ethereum, I probably don't care. I, I, I probably don't mind if I hold my Ethereum in a very illiquid form. So by illiquid form, what that means is that it, it's not easy for me to 
quickly buy and sell it. Now, if I'm very worried about Ethereum, I'll want to hold it in a format, which is very easy for me to quickly sell it. Uh, in the crypto world, to simplify it, the liquid form would be to hold it at an exchange. So there's lots of exchanges, you know, whether it's Coinbase, um, uh, Kraken, and so on. There's a whole bunch of exchanges which you can use to buy Ethereum. If you leave it at the exchange, it's very easy then to you have a balance at the exchange. Your Ethereum's held there. If you want to sell it, you can quickly just sell it because it's still on the exchange. So the balance is at the exchange. Alternatively, if I'm uh, if I'm very bullish and I don't really want my Ethereum to be held by a third party, I can hold it in my private wallet. So I could have my special USB stick or version of it, which is a private wallet, and just hold it on there. Um, and for me to kind of access that, I need my really long code to be able to access access that uh, that wallet. Um, or I could hold it in a custodian, a third party custodian. Uh, but in either way, it's held in a way which makes it harder for me to easily sell it. So if I'm holding in that form, that means I'm actually quite bullish. You know, so, so I'll, I, you know, I'll go to an exchange to buy Ethereum, then I take it off the exchange and put it into a format that's illiquid, which tells me, which tells us, the outsider who's tracking these flows, that actually this person is very bullish. So what we do is we track flows onto and off exchanges. And the idea is that if there's flows out of exchanges, that means that holders of Ethereum are very bullish. They're, they're basically taking off the exchange into a form that's illiquid. And so this is a chart which shows you uh, exchange flows over the course of this year, over 2021. And so you see in general, it's mainly orange lines down. So basically in general, people go onto an exchange, they buy their Ethereum and then they take it off. So that means in general, people who buy Ethereum tend to be quite bullish. There are occasions though, where they uh, push their Ethereum back onto the exchange. And so you see here, around May time this year, you suddenly saw some spikes of flows back onto exchanges uh, around this time. And this was the time where um, Ethereum uh, had a big rise and then fall, there's big correction here. And then over uh, September or so, when, when Ethereum was falling, uh, you saw flows back onto the exchange. There's a level of bearishness. Now, more recently, there's only been outflows. It's been one way. So this tells you that uh, the people who are buying Ethereum are basically taking it off exchange and they're comfortable uh, having it in an illiquid form, which means that they're bullish on Ethereum. So that's the second uh, measure we like to look at. So this is using exchange data, a bit more sort of crypto native, you could say. The third one is to, is to look at the futures activity. So we know there's a whole bunch of futures have been launched that, uh, that track Ethereum and also Bitcoin as well. And um, we, we basically like to look at uh, um, uh, the amount of open interest, the amount of contracts, long and short together, that are being used to trade Ethereum. So we don't care so much about positioning because in the end, the positioning nets to zero. What we care about is just the size of that market. And the, the exchanges that have futures include Binance, FTX, uh, Bybit, and there's a bunch of others as well. Um, but Binance is, is the largest uh, you know, within the ones we show here in terms of the, the uh, crypto native exchanges. Um, but the overall open interest, the blue line here, shows you that since, since around sort of October, we're tracking this on a shorter time period, uh, there's been a big increase in open interest, which is a bullish sign. Then if we look at CME, a traditional exchange, which has a very large volumes in, in, uh, in uh, Ethereum and Bitcoin futures, you see something similar as well, where there's been a big increase in open interest as well. So this tells us that there's uh, a lot of, sort of volumes or the amount of contracts on the exchanges are increasing. And so this, this kind of tells you that there's a lot of interest in the market, probably by institutions, as well as more crypto native investors. And again, this is a bullish signal for Ethereum. Uh, now the fourth one, um, and I'll talk about this before I hand off to Dalvey, who will talk about the, the, the other remaining factors we look at is hodler behavior. So hodler is just a kind of a slang, almost like a slang term to refer to uh, crypto investors who tend to be buy and hold or long-term investors. So it's, it's basically another way of saying a long-term investors. So what we like to do is we like to track um, the behavior of hodlers who have held Ethereum for different periods of time to get a sense of are people uh, uh, you know, churning their portfolios a lot? Are they just buying and selling crypto a lot? Or are they just holding on, on to 
their Ethereum, uh, which is more of a bullish signal. So the ones we care a lot about is we look a lot at the people who have held um, Ethereum for between six months and one year. So these are people who bought Ethereum six months ago, uh, between six months ago to a year ago. Um, so these would be people who are relatively new to the crypto world. They've enjoyed some gains. And are they still holding on to their crypto? And are they making up a large portion of the crypto market? And what we find is that is indeed the case. Six months to one year, hodlers are becoming a larger share of the overall uh, Ethereum community. And that's a very bullish signal. You know, we know that people... Uh, who've held it for one year or five years or more, you know, are a fairly significant portion of the Ethereum markets. And they, they, they you know, um, the five year plus people are holding around five, six percent. The, the one year plus community are holding, you know, around 15 to, to, to 20 percent, the one to two year mark. But what's, what's interesting for us is the more recent entrants to Ethereum, are they still holding on? And they are. So the, the, you know, our sort of data shows they are holding on to Ethereum. And this for us is a bullish signal because what you don't want is you don't want just the long-term guys to be holding because they're, they're the original the original kind of guys. Um, if the newbies come into crypto or Ethereum and uh, they're not holding on to Ethereum, then that's a bearish signal. But in this case, it's a bullish signal, which is, uh, which is constructive for Ethereum. So this is something we, we track and this is based on also on-chain analytics, you can get hold of this, this data. Um, I think what I'll do now is I'll, I'll, hand, I'll hand it off now to Dalvir. Um, Dalvir, do, do you want me to control the screen or, or do you want to control the screen? Um, you can control the screen if you want. I'll just have to scroll down um, if that's easier. Okay, yeah, great. Okay, let's, let's do that. Okay, yeah, thanks, Bill. Um, so the next, I'll go through the next three metrics we look at. Uh, and one of the, the first ones is that we look at the investor PL that we're seeing uh, in the crypto markets. So one of the benefits of the crypto markets is that we can track transactions much more easily than, you know, in traditional finance because everything is publicly available. Um, so with that being said, we look at three different metrics um, and it, they vary between sort of looking at unrealized profits and realized profits. So the first metric is called uh, the percentage supply and profit. Um, so if you scroll down a little bit below. Yeah, so this is chart 11 here. So this is uh, basically just showing you the percentage of all of the circulating Ethereum supply that's in profit. Um, and you know, naturally, as the price rallies, uh, you would expect this, uh, this value to go up. Um, and you know, right now, you know, it's touching almost 100% with, with, with the new all-time highs, which is something you kind of do expect. Um, the next thing we look at is the size of these unrealized profits. So chart 12 shows you the unrealized profit as a percentage of market cap. So right now it's at around 70-ish percent or, you know, at this time as of when the article was published. So what that's telling us is that, um, you know, we've got 100% of the coins almost in um, circulating in profit, but, you know, the, the actual value of those uh, unrealized profits are around 70% of market cap. Uh, again, when the price rallies, um, naturally you would expect uh, these ratios to increase. And then I'll scroll down a bit. And then chart 13, uh, this is a little bit more interesting. It's looking at a uh, realized profit. So it's the realized value divided by the value at creation, or uh, more simply, it's just a price sold uh, divided by the price paid. So this is called the spent output profit ratio uh, or SOPA for short. Um, and a couple of interesting things about SOPA is that, you know, when, when the market is bullish um, and SOPA is increasing, um, it's telling us, so if it's above one, it's telling us that investors are realizing profits. Um, if it's below one, it's telling us that they're realizing losses. Now, naturally, if you look at the uh, sort of the May bull run, um, when, you know, prices are registered to then all-time highs, SOPA was increasing, uh, you know, quite a lot with the price. But that's telling you that, you know, investors are realizing profits at the new highs. If you look at the most recent um, bull run, so from October onwards, there's been spikes in SOPA, but it's, it's bouncing between, you know, a lowish level of about 1.04 and a highest level of 1.16, uh, which is relatively, compared to the high scene in the May run of around, you know, 1.26, that's a much mu more muted, um, you know, increase. So what we're looking into that is, is that, well, this is a bullish signal in the sense that investors are not realizing profits at uh, the new uh, all-time highs as much as they were before. So, um, you know, logically that suggests that investors are reluctant to realize profits at these highs because they feel that the price will increase further. 
Um, so that's one thing about SOPA. The other thing is that uh, historically looking at where this level crosses one um, in a bull market as it touches one or retests one, historically, that's been a good time to buy. Uh, and equally on the flip side, uh, in a bear market, uh, as it retests one, you kind of fade and it's been a good, uh, good time to sell. So that's um, uh, these, these ratios, uh, naturally, all three of them will increase as uh, the Ethereum price increases. But, um, you know, I think it gives a bit more of a context, uh, you know, splitting out unrealized and realized in this way. Um, so, yeah, these three are giving very bullish signals um, at the moment. Uh, so on to that sort of different side of things. Um, th what we also like to look at, um, what's unique about sort of cryptocurrency is that, uh, you know, there's, there's this concept of, of mining uh, and, and hash rates and, and things like this, which is you know different to traditional finance. And perhaps I'll provide a bit of context about what mining actually is uh, before you know talking about these charts. So Ethereum currently works on something called a proof of work consensus protocol. Um, it's constructive for me to say right now that it, it is going to transition to something called proof of stake. Um, going forward, but you know, perhaps that's a conversation for another time. Um, but just to give a bit of an idea of what proof of work means, um, the proof of work consensus protocol basically is uh, a way of allowing the Ethereum network to come to uh, a consensus about things like balance, uh, transaction orders, uh, you know, stops people from you know, spending their coins twice, uh, you know, offers uh, resistance to attacks and makes the Ethereum network uh, very maintainable. Now, Proof of work, the idea of proof of work is it just sets the rules um, for the work that the underlying miners do. Now, work in this context is just mining. Um, and mining is just a process of uh, adding new blocks onto the blockchain. Um, and without getting too into the, the technical details of it, um, you know, the more work that's done uh, implies more mining that's done, which means more uh, it increases the length of the blockchain. And we can track this information. So you uh, one way to track mining activity is to look at um, you know the compute power that's associated uh, with the network. So mining um, you know requires compute power and you know a lot of compute power uh, to facilitate it. Um, so what we look at is the hash rate on, on the network. So the hash rate is basically just a measure of, uh, of compute power of average compute power on the network. Uh, you know as of the time the article was published, it was at around seven hundred and thirty six terahashes. The second, you know, currently latest numbers as of today, it's uh, closer to around 786. So it's, it's increasing. Uh, and more importantly, since bottoming out um, in, you know, late June after China crackdowns on crypto activity, it's had an upward trend ever since. Uh, and it's been consistently registering new all time highs. Now, from, uh, from, a, from a perspective of markets, this means that the network has, you know, more security. So it's less, uh, you know, prone to sort of attacks. Um, it's able to facilitate more transactions inherently because there's more compute power on the network. Um, and we view this as a bullish sign. Uh, and in tandem with hash rates, um, we look at something called minor revenue. And just, a bit of, just to give a, a bit of context about minor revenue, the process of uh, mining Bitcoins we spoke about earlier and facilitating transactions um, requires uh, compute power. Uh, miners need to be compensated for you know, investing in that compute power to facilitate transactions on the network and to allow the network to um, you know, be maintainable. Um, so what we look at is uh, the comparison between Ethereum uh, mining revenue and Bitcoin mining revenue. So we split it out, or we, we consider it together, but there's two kind of types of revenues on a broader level. So there's fees that uh, miners are paid for facilitating transactions. And then there's minted coins. So when a, when a miner uh, adds a new block to the blockchain, they're rewarded with freshly minted coins. Um, and these together form uh, the total minor revenue. Uh, and uh, what's, what's interesting about the comparison between Bitcoin and Ethereum is that, you know, ever since around August, uh, Ethereum has been, uh, you know, pretty, pretty largely outperforming Bitcoin in terms of minor revenue. Uh, and even in the latest sort of bull runs that we've seen in both of them, Ethereum's seen a big jump. Uh, and whilst Bitcoin's been increasing, uh, it's at a much more muted level than what we're seeing in Ethereum. So we view this as a bullish sign for Ethereum um, again. Uh, so if allow you scroll down a bit more. Uh, and then the last metric we look at, um, which is kind of specific to uh, Ethereum in this context, is uh, the DeFi markets. So uh, DeFi stands for decentralized finance. Um, and the key metric that we look at is uh, it's called the total value locked. So the total value locked in DeFi is just the total sum of deposits uh, of coins in um, decentralized finance protocols. So it could be in you know, lending or other financial products. 
um, such as on you know decentralized exchanges and things of that nature. Now, what's important for us is that um, the DeFi space is uh, it's, it's rapidly expanding. So you know here the blue line is showing you the total value locked, which is across all protocols. So there's a bunch of protocols and a bunch of different coins in this space. It's not just Ethereum. Um, and as of the time of publishing the article, it was around $250 billion. The latest number as of today, you know, it's closer to $284 billion. Um, and, you know, that just shows you just how fast this, this market is, is increasing. So what we look at is, well, how much of this, uh, you know, booming DeFi space is coming from Ethereum? Now, what you'll notice is that, you know, since the beginning of the year, the share that's of the DeFi space that's coming from Ethereum has been decreasing. Um, and this is almost natural because of the fact that there's so many different protocols entering the space. Um, but by, by and large, do you, uh, Ethereum is still the biggest player um, in this space. You know, right now, it's currently at around you know, 184 uh, billion of the 284 billion uh, is coming from Ethereum. So you know, that puts it at around a 66 to 67% dominance. And just to give you an idea of how far above the rest, uh, that is the next biggest protocol in the space, Binance, uh, contributes around $21 billion dollars to that space, which is only around a six or 7%. So, you know, it's, uh, you know, above almost, you know, 60 percentage points higher. Um, and we view this again uh, as a bullish sign for Ethereum. So as the total value locked increases and the proportion of that uh, coming from Ethereum is uh, still dominating, we again view as a bullish sign for Ethereum. Uh, thanks, thanks, you, a lot. Yeah, thanks a lot, Dalbea. And, and just to, uh, sort of summarize the main points here. So, you know, we, at the end, we kind of summarize this, but essentially we look at seven different factors. All of them currently are bullish for Ethereum. We look at institutional demand and the way we do that is we, we look at flows into ETFs and that is showing uh, increasing flows, which is bullish. We look at liquidity demand. Are crypto investors uh, willing to hold uh, Ethereum in a illiquid form, for example, in a private wallet and that is indeed the case people are taking money off exchanges into their private wallets which is bullish for etf uh, bullish for uh, ether or ethereum um, number three we look at futures activity is open interest is there more activity on these exchanges whether it's crypto exchanges or more traditional exchanges and that is indeed the case it's increasing we look at hodler behavior factor number four and we're finding that uh, the key cohort, the six month to one year people who bought it more recently, the newbies are indeed holding uh, crypto, Ethereum, which is bullish. We look at the PL of investors and we're finding that uh, investors are have either realized or unrealized profits, which is quite constructive for them to continue to hold uh, Ethereum. We look at mining activity and we find that revenues of Ethereum miners and the hash rate compute power dedicated to Ethereum is very high which tells you that uh, there's, there's a lot of robustness to the overall system. And then finally, we look at uh, decentralized finance space and we find that there's a lot of Ethereum that is being taken out of, of supply to be locked up to, to underwrite the decentralized finance uh, space, the DeFi space, which means that there's less supply of Ethereum in for investors, which then naturally boosts up the Ethereum price. Um, so these are the seven factors. We track this on a regular basis. You know, for updates, if you just you know, if you just come to the site, you'll see the regular updates. We do this for Bitcoin as well, and and hopefully it uh, it provides you know, a good framework and, and add some rigor to crypto markets in a way that you don't really find elsewhere. And I'm a researcher, so I kind of like to have some frameworks. Um, and and I think this is something that's quite useful as a way to kind of feel a bit more confident about your holdings or your investments in, in the crypto space. Cool. Thank you guys for the um, for the rundown. And what I'll do is, if we drop a comment below, if you have any questions at all, I'm sure the three of us be more than willing to to pick them up. So just just ask a question uh, if you have one. What I'll do as well is I'm just going to. Bilal has kindly said that because of this kind of one-off video that we've done today, that he's happy that if you go to the Macro Hive website and you just use the code AMPLIFY50, or one word, at the checkout, and you'll get a 50% discount uh, on your subscription for your Prime plan. So um, for one, I for sure, I mean, I my job is tracking news, but... Um, I don't have time to go to the granularity that these guys do. And I lean on them to do that. And so, you know, that's, they're the masters of that craft. And I, for one, definitely 
use that resource for, for the purpose that they've just discussed. So I'd highly, highly recommend it. But um, thank you for, for watching. Thank you to you both uh, for attending. And, and I've got another episode coming out where I'm talking to a specialist in fintech about the metaverse, which will be coming out as well later on uh, this week, which has a nice uh, tie into some of the discussions that we've had here as well. So, so stay tuned. But Bilal, uh, Devere, thank you very much. Great. Thanks for having us. Thank you.